Thank you so much. Um, and first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the staff of the National Library for inviting me and for setting this up. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you very much, everyone, for coming um, this evening or this afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Um, tonight, I'll be talking about German and Yiddish conversations in the archive, Itzik Munger and Paul Ceylon. In this talk, I compare two writers, Itzik Munger and Paul Ceylon, but I also wanna think about what makes such a comparison possible and to consider its stakes, why such a comparison mattered to readers in the past, as well as in the present, and how such a comparison might reshape our understanding of the history of Jewish literature in the 20th century. In broad strokes, such a comparison hinges upon the fraught relationship between German and Yiddish, Monger writing primarily in Yiddish and Ceylon in German. This linguistic nexus raises a number of questions and problems that extend beyond the specificities of these two writers. So before I turn attention to Monger and Ceylon in particular, I will briefly sketch some of the larger issues that arise at the intersection of German and Yiddish and point out some of the difficulties involved in studying this linguistic intersection. As many of you listening probably know, Yiddish is a Germanic language and both Yiddish and modern German derive from Middle High German. Yiddish is written in the Hebrew alphabet and with historical and regional variations includes Germanic, Lotion Koidish, Slavic and Romance components. Historically, the language was widely spoken by Ashkenazim throughout Central and Eastern Europe but in the 18th century, a split began to emerge between Jewish communities in Central Europe, where many adopted German, and Eastern Europe, where Yiddish gained a stronger hold. In the 18th century and after, German and Yiddish came to be associated with divergent trajectories of Jewish modernity, and their relative value became the object of intense debate. Indeed, in the wake of the Haskalah, the two languages were often understood to represent either side of a series of charged dichotomies such as West and East, German, Germanness and Jewishness, assimilation and disassimilation, or at the level of script, writing from left to right and right to left in the Latin and Hebrew alphabets. There existed, however, an often neglected counter tradition of writing that made use of these languages in conjunction, including in the form of translation and transcription, Deutschmerisch, or the use of modern German vocabulary and syntax in Yiddish writing, and various modes of interlingual and intertextual commentary. The diverse corpus of texts that emerged at the intersection of Yiddish and German extended far beyond the confines in particu of particular places and periods, and involved the likes of Sholem Yankov Abramovich, Moishele Palpern, Rosa Auslander, Natan and Solomon Birnbaum, Franz Kafka, Beate Pappenheim, Chava Rosenfarb, as well as Monger and Ceylon, among many others. But we should not forget the tenuousness, the vulnerability of this literature in the face of acculturation, anti-Jewish violence, and various ideological movements hostile to linguistic experimentation. For these reasons, the textual traces of the relationship between German and Yiddish language writing are not always found in published books. While we can point to a number of published translations, such as the multi-volume Yiddish translation of Heine's work and the popular renditions of Sholem Aleichem in Paris and Interwar Germany, as well as to a number of scholarly texts and a handful of writers who published in both languages, such as the Bjornbaums, much of what we know about the relationship between German and Yiddish language literature in the long 20th century can only be found in more fragile forms, in writers' notebooks, in journals, in correspondence, in macaronic or bilingual experiments scratched down onto a spare sheet of paper. In this regard, I'm taking a cue from a number of literary scholars, such as Nama Rokem, Maya Barzalai, Adriana Jacobs, Sunny Yudkoff, and Jan Kuna, who have in recent years worked to demonstrate the multilingual affiliations of modern Hebrew literature by uncovering the significance of German, French, Arabic, Yiddish, Russian, English, and other languages in the lives of seemingly monolingual writers. Some of this en engages um, in what might be called an archival turn, a turn away from the published books and toward literary archives where drafts of poems and other manuscripts often reveal 
a more multilingual story than the library. One second, I'm going to share my screen now. Okay. Um, so a quick detour that I think illustrates the promise of this archival turn in one apropos of the National Library is Franz Kafka's now famous speech on the Yiddish language, which he referred to as jargon. Delivered in 1912 in Prague, the German language speech introduced an evening of recitations of Yiddish poetry by the actor Yitzhak Levy. The speech, not least because of its famous author, has become one of the most widely cited texts about the relationship between German and Yiddish. It's a text that addresses a German speaking audience and playing upon the affective charge of this linguistic encounter, Kafka encourages them not to be frightened, even if, as he remarks, dread of Yiddish. Dread mingled with a certain fundamental distaste is after all understandable. Kafka's speech is too intricate um, to go into detail here, but his sketching of the tensive relation between German and Yiddish, despite certain points of error, underscores the stakes involved. The linguistic comparison entails, that is, a confrontation of what Kafka calls Western European conditions, which appear well-ordered only in a deliberately superficial way, and the tangle of Yiddish. Kafka further tarries with seemingly untranslatable words, death and blood, toit and blut, pointing to the existential stakes of the fragile distance between German and Yiddish, a fragility born of their apparent nearness and power asymmetry, one a language of the state and empire with codified laws, the other a language that is stateless. For Kafka, as for many others, the two languages index two alternative and even contradictory forms of life. It should not be forgotten that Kafka's speech, was a, which has attracted a number of um, the attention of a number of writers, scholars, and readers, was first published posthumously in 1953 by Max Brod as part of a collection of texts from Kafka's Nachlass or archive. The speech demonstrates that is the importance of archives to our understanding of the relationship between German and Yiddish literature um, in the 20th century. Indeed, if Max Brod had not preserved Kafka's papers, we would only be able to speculate about Kafka's interest in and knowledge of Yiddish, for there are scant references to the language and the work published during his lifetime. The introductory speech on Yiddish is further remarkable because it exists only in a transcript made by Elza Brod, the, white, uh, the manuscript of which was recently digitized by the National Library of Israel after a long and controversial legal battle over the literary estate of Max Brod, the stamp of which can be seen here um, in the lower hand side um, in the left hand corner. The status of this text is frequently overlooked by scholars who often cite the text as if it were simply something that Kafka wrote and then published, but examining the manuscript in the archive reveals to adopt a term from the scholar Karen Emmerich, the instability of the text. And as Jean-Christophe Baudier argues in his study of the shadow archives of African-American literature, literary papers and the worlds they bring together, personal records and private estates, institutional libraries in the marketplace, archival science and copyright law have increasingly determined the conditions of possibility for the future of literary study. Conditions further determined by legal disputes about where Kafka belongs to Israel, to Germany, to the Czech Republic, to specific families, to the public, to no one, to everyone. The possibility is opened by, um, the possibility is opened up by archival study can further be explored if we consider the ties that bind and separate Manger and Ceylon, to whom I will now turn. For in archives in Jerusalem and in Marbach, we can see the multilingual worlds opened up beyond the bounds of the book. Itzik Manger was born in 1901 in Chernovitz in what was in the capital of Bukovina, part of the Habsburg Empire in what is now Ukraine. Born Isidor Helfer, he grew up in a Yiddish speaking family, though in a famously multilingual milieu, where as the poet Rosa Auslander once wrote, 
one could hear quadrilingual fraternizing songs in the time asunder. The Jewish community in Bukovina was largely Yiddish or German speaking and sometimes both, but Romanian was also a constant and increasing presence and many learned Hebrew and later on Russian and Ukrainian. From early on, Manger embraced poetry and song and he was raised in an artistic home where the family also worked as tailors. He also became immersed in the world of the theater and stagings and performances and the life behind the curtains. Despite this upbringing, early on, Monger would sometimes present himself as having been born in Berlin and as having chosen to immigrate to Eastern Europe and to adopt Yiddish. In his 20s, Monger moved to Warsaw, which was at the time one of the leading cultural centers um, for Yiddish. Dovid Roskies writes that he arrived with thick, disheveled flowing hair, blazing eyes, and a lighted cigarette perpetually dangling from his lips. To the Yiddish literary scene of that city, Monger was an exotic newcomer. He would call this period, 1928 to 1938 in Warsaw, my most beautiful decade. It was by far his most productive, so Roskies. During this period, Munger self-fashioned himself as a troubadour, and he incessantly mined Jewish folk traditions as a quarry for his writing. He became especially well known for his ballads and later for his um, poetic retellings of biblical stories, which he transposed to Eastern European locales and other anachronistic settings. He had a prodigious memory and gave numerous lectures about literary and cultural topics, and he stood out for his animated reading of poetry which captivated diverse audiences. In conjunction with his published volumes um, and writings in the press, Monger's readings and lectures quickly established him as one of the leading figures in the Yiddish literary world, in the so-called Yiddish land. Monger spent much of his life in transit and he was plagued by alcoholism and financial problems, often living off the support of friends and women whom he sometimes abused. After Hitler's seizure of power in 1933, Munger eventually had to flee um, Warsaw, first to Paris in the late 1930s, then eventually to England and the United States, where his poetic output largely withered. He died in Israel in 1969. Paul Ceylon was born 19 years after Munger, also in Chernovitz, in, in what was then part of Romania after World War I. Born Paul Anschel, he was raised in a Jewish German speaking family and attended German, Romanian and Hebrew language schools. Unlike Manger, who only did, um, who did not last long in the gymnasium, Ceylon eventually went on to study medicine in France and then romance languages and literatures in Chernovitz. From early on, Manga and Ceylon were separated by age, class, education and mother tongue, but they shared a birthplace in milieu and they were both exposed to similar poetic influences. Like Ceylon, the young Manger absorbed the work of Goethe, Rilke, Hofmannsthal, and Velan. And they were both influenced by the Yiddish fables of Eliezer Steinberg and by the Yiddish theater, which Ceylon would visit with, with Ruth Kraft, who introduced him to the Yiddish scene and to War Chernovitz. Certain figures such as Hersh Segal, whom I will return to, also linked them and served as bridges between the Yiddish and the German worlds. Manger and Ceylon were also both marked in profound but divergent ways by the experience of the Holocaust. In Chernovitz, Ceylon and his parents were eventually restricted to the ghetto and his parents were later deported. His father died of typhus and his mother was shot and murdered. Ceylon was confined to a forced labor camp where he dug, as he later said, and where, according to the poet Jerome Rothenberg, he was he reported to have learned Yiddish. After the war, which Monger survived in relative safety, but under debilitating physical and psychological conditions in exile, Ceylon made his way to Bucharest and Vienna before immigrating to Paris, where he taught where he taught German language and literature, and where he established his reputation as a poet and translator though a very different reputation from that of Monger. Ceylon's work received enthusiastic and serious reviews and prizes, but his work also received hostile and anti-Semitic responses, 
and he was falsely accused of plagiarism. In the last years of his life, he was frequently hospitalized in psychiatric clinics, and he took his own life in 1970. What are we to make of a comparison of these two poets, two Chernovitz writers in Yiddish and in German, and what might we learn from such a comparison? To my knowledge, there is no evidence that they ever met. Monger left Chernovitz when Ceylon was still a young boy, and despite possible periods of overlap in France in the late 1930s, a personal meeting seems unlikely. But despite their personal distance, a conjoined reading of their work and of their archives in particular, as I will show, uncovers motley and multilingual networks of writers and readers and demonstrates that in the shadow of the archive, the distance between these two writers transformed at times into points of closeness. While there does not exist a large body of scholarship about the relationship between Manger and Ceylon. When this relationship is invoked, it is often negative. The two writers were, so the story goes, certainly aware of one another, but they were opposed. Israel Halfen's important biography of Ceylon's youth is paradigmatic in this regard. In a widely cited passage, after recalling Ceylon's appreciation of Eliezer Steinberg, Halfen notes that beyond Steinberg's fables, you never heard Paul speak Yiddish. He viewed the language as corrupted German and, for example, did not consider the local Yiddish poet Itzik Manger, who would later achieve worldwide fame in America, to be a real poet, but rather a folkloristic phenomenon. This fascinating passage provides insight into Ceylon's exposure to and apparent rejection of Yiddish cultural activism and interwar Chernovitz, but it should give us pause not only because it relies on secondhand accounts, but also because it describes a youthful view, one that even if accurate, should not be assumed to be stable throughout Ceylon's life, especially in the wake of the Holocaust. Coffin's descriptive vocabulary is also telling um, and a bit confusing. Manger is a local poet because he is from Chernovitz perhaps, um, but also perhaps because the author views him as provincial Though in the same breath, Hoffman notes Munger's worldwide fame, which he interestingly locates in the United States. Um, and indeed in Ceylon's library um, from after the war, um, which is preserved in Marbach in Germany, there are two books um, that contain poetry by Munger, including the Yiddish language, um, uh, Six uh, Lullabies by Hersh Segal, um, but also um, an English language book, um, Ruth Whitman's um, anthology of modern Yiddish poetry, which includes English language translations of Manger. But to return to the Halfen quote, um, Halfen's description also plays up a contrast um, that has often been made, but one that we should be wary of. Ceylon as a real poet, the last representative of modernism, and Manger as a folklorist, the author of popular songs and ballads. These characterizations or even caricatures pervade a lot of the popular and even some of the scholarly um, writing about manga and Ceylon and about Yiddish and German language literature more generally. And they factor even in a biography as careful and insightful as Halfen's. The wager of the rest of this talk is that a careful look at both manga and Ceylon's published and unpublished work in the files and boxes of the archive a more dynamic and nuanced picture emerges. In Munger's case, what we now know about his life and artistic produ um, production and about his archive, largely preserved in the National Library of Israel, but also in other collections um, worldwide, what we know is indebted, is largely indebted to the research of Efrat Gal Ed, whose monumental critical biography of Munger, published in German in 2016, marks a major advance in the study of his life and work. Gal Ed's biography also bears a suggestively Ceylonian title, if I may, Niemann's Sprache. Um, but in the next few slides, I want to present some of the materials held in the Manger archive at the National Library, 
Um, many of these materials are analyzed in Gal Ed's biography, um, and I encourage anyone interested to read her book if you haven't already. So pictured here on the screen is a youthful notebook that Munger wrote when he was still a teenager and living in Yasi. It is at least trilingual and includes passages in Yiddish, German, and Romanian. He used the notebooks from both left to right and from right to left, and sometimes combined languages and scripts, Latin and Hebrew in a macaronic dance. On the title page pictured here, you can see on, left, on the left-hand side on top, the Yiddish kveten or blossoms, and underneath in Latin letters, poesy, manger, is written in Latin letters on the left and in Hebrew block letters on the right. The notebook indeed is an explosion of language and it testifies to Munger's youthful struggle to orient himself as a writer and to find a language of expression. The notebook contains early poems in Yiddish such as Mein Muse and Herbs pictured here, which are written in a highly Germanized Yiddish on the right, the poem begins, for example, my muse is blas und verumert, my muse is pale and despondent. Already in the first line, for instance, he spells blas with a double samich, mirroring the German double S. In his early poem, Munger's early poems thus dismantle the border between German and Yiddish, or at least trouble it. And as Gall Ed notes, these poems perhaps represent the very German poems that Munger is said to have written in adolescence, if we understand German and Yiddish here as porous languages that spill and blur into one another. The poems at the very least reflect Munger's deep engagement with German language literature, with the vocabulary and sounds of the likes of Hofmannsthal and Rilke. Um, in the notebooks, there are likewise catalogs of books mostly German or in German translation. Um, a few names pictured here include Etea Hoffmann, uh, Kleist, Thomas Mann, Maupassant in German translation. Um, these reading lists, which would overlap significantly with those of the young Ceylon, give texture to later biographical anecdotes. Um, as when Manger in the wake of the Holocaust recalled being crowned with the title poet, gekrönt das erste Mal mit dem Titel Dichter, for his theatrical adaptation of Goethe's ballad, The Loyal Eckhart. The notebook also contains what seem to be the plans for work in German, a morning play, for instance, titled Vater or Father. Um, this notebook, the notebook is, as Carl Ed writes, not a journal or diary that recounts experiences or events, it is rather a noting of poems, verses, fragments of prose, aphorisms, and ideas for theater pieces. It is an accumulation of language and of languages, an experimental field and a kind of testing ground that leads up to his apparent choice to become a Yiddish writer in 1918 um, in the midst of his writing this notebook. Similar experiments can be seen in slightly later manuscripts, such as the following poem cycle, written in Yiddish and Latin transcription, recalling the hybrid renditions of many ethnographic texts about Yiddish literature and folklore, which often combine translation and transcription, as well as later anthologies of Yiddish literature published in Latin letters, um, including one edited by the aforementioned Hersh Segal um, and by Is uh, Itzik Manger's brother. Um, Manger's manuscript here, here recalls these efforts and reveals his own efforts to render language in a way more accessible to the German reader without translating per se. He uses, um, these are just close-ups of the previous images, um, a footnote, for instance, on the left-hand side to gloss um, Hunem as Gesicht, face, and parentheses to gloss Kulias as crutches, Ongegoret as hockend, girding, crouching, favored as verwirrt, confused, um, etc. But these manuscripts should not be reduced to attempts at accessibility. Many words are not glossed, epis, levona, moira, and others more closely approximate German than Yiddish. 
We can also look at lines like on the top on the right hand side, der Levonus müder Schnechel gieß sich aus in wild Gelächter. The moon's tired smile pours out into wild laughter. In these lines, Munger uses a hybrid form of language, one perhaps motivated by the desire to reach a German reading audience, but also one that reveals his early notebooks and manuscripts as a quasi-private space of multilingual and multidirectional reflection, where language and languages become sites of longing and aspiration, of emotional intensity like in Kafka's speech. A sense of dread suffuses these papers. The muse is pale and despondent, but there is also a sense of joy and release, a pouring out into wild laughter. These manuscripts immediately dispel any notion that Munger was simply a folkloristic phenomenon, but they also help us to see how his later turn toward folklore was a deliberate act, one that emerged out of intensive reflection on literary history and out of exuberant and sometimes despairing experimentation with language. As he pushed and fractured the boundaries of Yiddish expression, a kind of linguistic work that took a very different form from Ceylon's later on, but not, I would suggest, a form in opposition to Ceylon's own freighting and fracturing of language. While in his later work, Munger avoided the kind of Deitschmirisch that, perv that pervades his early notebooks and manuscripts, his engagement with German culture did not end, um, though it became increasingly fraught and wounded. Um, here's an early translation of Heine, which I won't go into for reasons of time, um, but I'd be happy to return to any of these examples later on if there's interest. Um, suffice it to note that the, there's like a really inventive uh, and ingenious use of rhyme in the translation. It's quite beautiful. Uh, in, in German, die Mitternacht zog näher schon in Stumme Ruhe lag Babylon. And in Munger's Yiddish, die Mitternacht hoch nennte zu gehielten Bovo in Stumme Ruhe. Um, anyway, the, the, his translations are quite interesting. Um, Munger also translated poems by Richard Demel and Elsa Lasker Schuler, and he participated in, in some of the translations of his own work into German, for instance, by Alfred Margot Sperber, um, who was all, also an early mentor of Ceylon. Um, Efrat Gal-Ed also uncovered a translation of Georg Büchner's Wojtzeck, um, which uh, Munger collaborated on, though without credit, um, with Rochel Euerbach. Um, but in the late 1930s and 1940s, Munger's reflections on German increasingly turned toward the corruption of German language and culture after the rise of National Socialism. As Dovid Roski's notes, for instance, while living in a shelter for emigrants in southern France, Munger was haunted by dreams of Goethe with a rubber truncheon in his hand, Immanuel Kant wearing an SS uniform. Faust wearing a swastika on his right arm in blood, blood, Jewish blood. One can get a sense of the larger transformation of Munger's work in the face of the Holocaust in the cover art pictured here for, nine, for his 1952 Lied und Ballade, um, where it seems we can again see the tired face of the moon from his manuscript, but instead of pouring out into wild laughter, there are tears falling into an outstretched hand covered in barbed wire. The sense of decline that permeates Munger's later work is made explicit in 1967, when Munger writes that my song ends with this book. Though not everything that I have created has been collected even now. The period of my being in America, that period where, as Hoffman notes, he became world famous, became the most sterile period in my life. On one side, a murdered language, a shrunken language territory, where one must literally walk on one's toes because of the narrowness. Munger died two years later. Let us return to our comparison between Munger and Ceylon, between Yiddish and German. We have already seen that Munger's trajectory was more complex and searching, that a simple description of one as poet and one as folklorist is not sufficient. Another comparison, again anecdotal, 
um, was made at a concert by the Yiddish poet and singer Bela Schechter Gottesman, who was born in Vienna, but who had strong ties to Yiddish. Um, and I'll play it. It's a very short clip now. Just one second. Oh, I think there might be a technical problem. But that's okay, I can read it. It's very short. Um, so in this, so it's a concert that Bela Schechter Gottesman gives and she's about to sing um, Monger's very famous song, Offenweg steht der Bäum. And if you Google Monger Ceylon, Bela Gottes, um, Schechter Gottesman, you'll find it on YouTube or on Spotify. It's um, not hard to find. Um, and before she sings Offenweg steht der Bäum, she, um, pauses to give a brief overview of just to talk to the audience briefly and she recalls having a strange memory in 1947 when she was in Vienna with her husband um, and she walked in a street in Vienna um, and who comes along she writes or she says Paul Ceylon and without hello or any introduction Ceylon just says Itzik Monger was the greatest Yiddish poet and then he walks away without goodbye, like an apparition. Um, so like Hoffman, this is a very, this is a fascinating anecdote. Um, if one that still needs to be taken with a, maybe a grain of salt. <laughs> it is the inverse of Ceylon's supposed youthful view um, recounted in Hoffman's biography. And it implies a scene of recognition of the Schechter Gottesman's recognition of Ceylon and of Ceylon's recognition of them, or at least his notice of them speaking in Yiddish. It points, that is, to a group of Landsleit from Chernovitz and from the larger Bukovina who followed literary and artistic developments across linguistic boundaries. Schechter Gottesman's claim that Ceylon was like an apparition is further suggestive and, be, and can be taken as a figure for the archival impulse um, that underlies the literary history that I'm interested in sketching here. For the fragile ties between German and Yiddish often frayed and disappeared from view. Um, they are spectral, fraught with absences and removals as Jean-Christophe Clotier writes, like apparitions, um, but they come alive in textual remnants in marginalia and in the heaps of paper and archives. So let me just... Um, that's Bela Schechter Gottesman. At the very least, Schechter Gottesman's anecdote, Ceylon appearing in Vienna and uh, declaiming that Itzig Monger was the greatest Yiddish poet, gives a sense of how dynamic and shifting cultural formations can be, and how Ceylon himself had transformed in the wake of the Holocaust. Indeed, his poetry moved away from the romantic beauty of his early poetry and not altogether unlike Monger toward an engagement with the corruption of German, of, of the German tradition and with possible alternatives in the history of Jewish languages and literatures, including folklore. This can be seen for instance in Ceylon's poem Benedicta, which quotes and transcribed Yiddish, which you can see on the right hand side zoomed in a bit, um, which quotes and transcribed Yiddish, a Yiddish folk song that implores if one can go to heaven to ask God if things must be, um, that implores if, one, it's, if it's possible to go to heaven um, to ask God if things must be as they are. In, Fel in John Felstner's translation, Ceylon writes to an unspecified you in the poem, you that heard when I shut my eyes, how the voice stopped singing after its moves of Zoe sign, Wie die Stimme nicht weiter sang, 
wie die Stimme nicht weiter sang nach, es muss es so sein. You that spoke it in the eyeless ones, the pastures, the same, the other word, blessed, drunken, blessed, gebenched. This is a poem that melds and interrogates folklore, linguistic turns, silence, drinking, and religion in ways that are perhaps not so distant from manga. In its juxtaposition of languages and in its use of transcription, in its opening up of a space of reflection on the closeness and distance of gebene diet, um, getrunken, gesegnet, gebenched. In the poem, Ceylon, like Monger, reflects upon the multilingualism in which he lives and writes, and he prompts the reader to think beyond monolingual categories. Similar uses of language, and specifically the Yiddish inflection of German, can likewise be found in Ceylon's prose piece, Conversation in the Mountains, Gespräch im Gebirg, um, as analyzed in a recent and revelatory dissertation um, by Ohad Kohn. Um, and in Ceylon's archive, which is largely held at the German Literature Archive in Marbach, um, which also petitioned, by the way, against the National Library in Jerusalem to obtain Max Brod's papers cited earlier, one can find further evidence of Ceylon's evolving position toward Yiddish. While there is no indication that he seriously considered writing in the language, unlike Manger with German, we can see that Yiddish mattered to Ceylon and to some of his readers in important ways. Um, in this final section, I will highlight two instances of correspondence, the first with Nelly Zaks, um, which has been published, and the second with Fried Weininger, which has been overlooked. So in 1961, around the time Ceylon wrote Benedicta, he writes a letter to the German Jewish poet, Nelly Zaks, who was in a patient at a psychiatric clinic in Sweden. Zaks had earlier written a letter to Ceylon in Paris in which he drafted a poem that begins, so lonely as man searches eastwards where melancholy appears in the face of dusk. Testifying to Zox's psychological distress, to what has been called her persecution mania in the ongoing wake of the Holocaust, the poem orients the reader eastwards and thus recalls the directional pull of Ceylon's frequent allusions in his poetry and prose to Chernovitz, the so-called Vienna of the East, where both he and Monger were born and raised. Ceylon responds to Zox's poem in a letter that thanks her and then acknowledges her voice and vulnerability. In the loneliest hour, he writes, I thank you, I hear you. He reaches out to her in language, in the German language, but he also reaches beyond the limits of their shared mother tongue and allows another language to be heard and perhaps to console. Following the eastward trajectory of Zox's poem, Ceylon writes, um, in Chernovitz where we live, the Jews always offered a wish when they said goodbye to each other, sei gesund. That is not a German expression, but a Yiddish one. And so now I permit myself to say once more, jetzt noch einmal sagen auf Yiddish und mit hebräischen Buchstaben, sei gesund. In Yiddish and with Hebrew letters, be healthy. In his letter, Ceylon uses and turns attention to Yiddish, which he recalls hearing in Chernovitz. He situates the language in the past tense within a specific context and within the multilingual soundscape of his youth. In his reference to the idiomatic difference of Yiddish and to its other alphabet, he harnesses what the scholar Nomi Seidman has called the meta value of language, how certain languages signify in themselves in order to augment here a message of comfort and hope, be healthy a sense of consolation that was apparently also provided by the monger poem that Gottes Menschechter sings, often vague Städte Boim, which was sung during the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. In his letter to Zach, Ceylon seems to demarcate here the consolatory limits of German, the language of national socialism, in which both he and Zach write. He foregrounds, that is, the distance, or at least the difference, of German and Yiddish, even as he draws upon their apparent closeness. In a very different time and place, Ceylon is using the form of the letter as a space of reflection and as a means of orientation in language in the world. 
In the German literature archive in Marbach, another set of correspondence can be found. Several letters to Ceylon by Fried Weininger, which have not been included in recent published editions of Ceylon's correspondence. Weininger was likewise born in Chernovitz in 1915 and fled to the United States um, in the 1940s before eventually immigrating to Israel in 1966, or in the late 60s, I'm not sure about the date. In 1966, Weininger writes to Ceylon as Eamalaga Chernovitzer, as a landsman, and expresses his hope that they might meet in Paris. Weininger writes these letters in German, but he notes his unease with the language. He mentions that he is out of practice and apologizes for any spelling or grammar mistakes. He writes about his own poetry and remarks, I don't know if you can read Yiddish, but I want to personally give you my volume of poetry. It is my great wish to get to know a great poet connected not only by the world of art, but also by the wellspring of home, the Bukovina. Es ist mein großen Wunsch, einen großen Dichter kennenzulernen, mit dem mich nicht nur die Welt der Kunst verbindet, sondern auch die Quelle der Heimat, die Bukovina. To my knowledge, we don't have access to Ceylon's response. But the amount of Yiddish writing that Weininger would later send him gives us an idea of his answer. In the subsequent months, Weininger would begin to send Ceylon draft translations of his poems, including Death Fugue and Corona. On November 9, 22, 1966, for instance, Weininger writes, and I'll read it in English, but the German um, is on the screen. Here is a new and improved version of the poem Corona a poem whose title resonates very differently now in the present. Um, but I'm working now on Death Fugue. Also, I mean, the poem Corona is really interesting because it, it has a lot of references to Rilke and to, and to Herbst, uh, to Fall. Um, and there's, a, uh, there's moments that are very mon monger-like. Um, uh, um, I am working now on Death Fugue. This is also completed um, but I want to master the idiomatic language, the idiomatische Sprache Meistern, so that it sounds more Jewish than German. You will receive it shortly. This deceptively simple letter reveals a lot about Weininger's approach to translation and about the stakes of such an effort um, and the transform stakes of um, what it meant to translate, for instance, Heine's poem into Yiddish um, in the early 20th century. Weininger's desire to translate death fugue into idiomatic Yiddish leads him to depart from what Shlomo Bickel once called um, this particular poem's unique music, Egene Musik. Um, Weininger attempts to integrate the poem in his rendition Fuge von Teut into Yiddish literature so that it sounds Jewish too. His translation is domesticating rather than foreignizing but it is a domestication from the vantage point of a minor language that had been persistently considered foreign and other. Weininger's translation should thus be understood as an ethical and political action insofar as it domesticates a poem within a literature that had recently lost the majority of its readers. And as Monger writes, as quoted before, a language that was forced into a shrunken territory where one must literally walk on one's toes because of the narrowness. In translation, Weininger endeavors to master, to meister on the language of a poem that famously depicts death as a master from Germany in his Yiddish rendition, Der Teut is the Meister von Deutschland. Weininger's translation, choice, um, translation choices point to the politics of translation. In his initial letter to Ceylon, in its deference to the great poet, points up the inequalities that structure the literary field in which they worked. An inequality that undergirds the fact that to my knowledge, Weininger's own papers have not been secured in the institutional archive, and one that animates a caustic passage in Hersch Segal's later study of Monger, in which he recalls that an Austrian Catholic writer claimed that Todesfuge is the greatest poem in the German language about the Holocaust, 
but Vegal angrily protests, what does this Austrian writer know about Yiddish poetry? He has no idea. Vegal's own papers are in similar fashion, partially preserved only in a family archive in Irvine, California. Um, but his own Yiddish language lectures about Ceylon, which he delivered outside Tel Aviv in the 1970s, have also been lost and are only available in a German translation by his son. Nonetheless, some of uh, Zegal's letters to the Yiddish poet, the great Yiddish poet, Ovrom Sutzkever, are preserved in the National Library in, in Israel. And they provide a sense of the kind of materials that have been lost. His letters engage in close readings of Sutzkever's poems, including the poem, Bosvet um, Bleiben, with constant reference to Ceylon, Manger, Rilke, and other poets that link the two writers under consideration here. In a further elaboration, and now I'm coming to a conclusion, of the inequalities that structure any comparison of Manger in Ceylon of Yiddish and German, Alexander Spiegelblatt, a colleague of Sutzkever, makes a poignant observation that after the Holocaust, Ceylon stood against his will at a new beginning in his poetic path. It was not possible for him to continue his earlier style of writing. Um, an earlier style that might be added that shared much with um, the youthful procl proclivities of Manger. It's like Manger, he continues, 20 years older than Ceylon, stood after the Holocaust against his will at the end of his poetic path. No new beginning, no new style was possible for him. The linguistic abyss threatened to consume them both. The murderers corrupted Ceylon's language, German, and they murdered Manger's language, Yiddish. I want to conclude by recalling that though a comparison of these writers, Manger and Ceylon, may perhaps culminate in the linguistic abyss um, and in a sense of incommensurability, such a comparison prompts us nonetheless to follow the detours, the Umwege to quote Ceylon, that took them out of their shared home city and that took them beyond the bounds of their mother tongue. In following the traces of these detours, not only in their published work, but also in their archives, we can begin to overhear a larger conversation, one that's often overlooked or forgotten in and between German and Yiddish, and one, of course, not restricted to these languages. We can gain, that is, a more finely textured and nuanced understanding of how these languages, so often opposed in the 20th century, came to matter for specific writers and readers for whom these languages and the spaces between them were fraught with intensity as sites of longing and aspiration, of aesthetic promise and political agitation, of pain and abandonment, of inequality and mastery, of corruption and of consolation. In reading Manger and Ceylon together, we can gain access, as Camila Milio writes in a different context, to a greater echoing space in which a net of voices, in which a net of voices, times and places may resonate. And we can learn to read and hear these writers in other ways and in other languages than we thought we knew. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Matthew. There are, there are a few questions and many compliments in the chat. Um, Christina asked, are there any scanned and available online um, in full or in parts, Yiddish handwritten texts of Manger or Ceylon? Um, I, as far as I know, the Manger collection is not digitized at all by the National Library. I could be wrong about that. <laughs> um, however, a lot of the materials, um, not all of them, are reproduced in pretty high quality images in Efrat Gal Ed's biography of Itzik Manger. Um, so you, I mean, I think one of the real gifts of that biography is that you can actually, um, you know, really sit with these documents by reading her work, not just mediations of the documents. Um, Ceylon, most of Marbach's collection is not digitized. Um, 
Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Christina also asks, um, are there any articles or analysis uh, available to read in more detail in the presented uh, uh, today analysis? Thank you. Yes, the question about um, any articles or analysis available to read more details uh, than the presented today. Thank you. Um, uh, <laughs> kind of a broken record. I, again, Efrat Ed's biography, which is available only in German, I think, still. Um, she also has an article um, about Munger's early work and um, in English um, about his early poetry and his um, the influence of figures like Rilke on his work. Um, so if you're interested in that, I would I would point you there. Um, on Ceylon, I you know there's there's very little actually about Ceylon in Yiddish. Um, Israel Halfen's biography, which I had a somewhat critical view of tonight, um, does have actually a lot of interesting information about the Yiddish circles um, in Chernovitz, and that's available in German and English. Um, and I would recommend that if you're interested in kind of exploring that further. Um, also, Hersh Segal's uh, lectures about, um, about Ceylon in Yiddish. So we, I, as far as I'm aware, we don't have access to the Yiddish language originals, but there's a German translation made by a son that is, it used to be available as a PDF online. I'm not sure if it still is, but if you Google Hersh Segal Ceylon, you know, something along those lines, hopefully you'll be able to find it. Um, and then I would also point you to Ohad Kohn, who was, is a PhD student at Tel Aviv University. He wrote his master's dissertation about uh, Yiddish in Ceylon, so it's a kind of a linguistic and literary analysis of Ceylon's language, um, especially of conversation in the mountains, Kishpresh and Gebirg, um, that has a lot of really interesting information and is available online. Thank you very, very much. Thank you all for being here. Uh, it was wonderful to see so many people from all over the world. I'm going to uh, release microphones so that you can say thank you personally to Matthew and ask any more questions if you have any. Thank you very much, and we'll see you in our next event. Thank you. Matthew, for this very interesting presentation. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> um, I see Thank that. Um, I, I actually, I. I agree that I see the, the point you made in the, the chat about this interesting passage and um, Weininger's letter to Ceylon where he writes about wanting it to sound, you know, mastering the idiomatic language and to make it sound more Yiddish, <laughs> meaning Yiddish. Um, I, it's interesting though, because um, in the letters, he often refers to Yiddish and he writes it in English with a Y-I-D-D-I-S-H. Um, and there's a divergence here. So I agree that it means Yiddish, well, but there's an interesting kind of- The reason, Matthew, if I may interrupt you, this yeah, is not please. that it means both. The reason is that the Jews who lived in the Austrian empire, in Vienna, in Graz, and of course in Chernovitz, when they spoke about Yiddish, they referred to it in German as Yiddish. Yeah. The same does Kafka in his diary, for example, yeah. in his famous piece about the small literatures, not minor, in German kleine Literatur. He speaks about the Yiddish Sprache, Tschechische und Jüdische Sprache. And by Yiddish, he exactly means Yiddish. And Ruth Kraft, who lived in yeah. Germany and spoke about Yiddish till, until her death, she spoke about Yiddish in German as yeah. Yiddish. I used to ask her, why, do you, why don't you say Yiddish? Because she said, because we call it Yiddish. Yiddish is Yiddish. Yeah, no, I, no, I, uh, I of course I agree. Um, I, it's just, there's that, there's that interesting slippage in its own spelling, but I, it's maybe just a slippage. <laughs> um, thank you. <laughs>
Thank you for the detailed analysis, as I wrote down originally from Chernovitz and uh, uh, Paul Salon was the topic of my research, so it was very interesting to go into detail. So thank you very much for the presented analysis. It was very interesting. I will pay attention to some details more after this event. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Uh, well, I would like to thank you also. I'm speaking from Piatono, uh, Israel. Uh, I'd like to ask you if uh, you know the translations of Celan, of um, Pierre Norris. It's uh, relatively yeah. new. Yes. And he was in Israel also. And he we had some uh, in the Rubin Museum, the Rubin Museum. We had special uh, an evening about that. Mm. And second, I'd like to know if you are going or if you studied the surrealism of uh, Celan in context uh, with the language key in German and Gerasim Luca in French, because they are coming from the same nucleus of Jewish surrealist poems that came from not also from Chernobyl, but I'm also from uh, the north of Romania and Bucharest. Yeah, I mean, to start with the latter point, I, I think that's a really important dimension. Um, also for Monger, surrealism in some larger sense. Um, but I, yeah, I, I have written down, <laughs> um, I'm familiar with some of it, but not in detail. Um, uh, the Pierre Joris translations, I think, are wonderful. Um, that's, I think it's a major event in, in, in the English reception of Ceylon. Um, I also think that there's a kind of interesting under, you know, to kind of sit with the Yiddish a bit, there's an interesting undercurrent to Ceylon's English reception that overlaps a bit with his Yiddish. Um, so Jerome Rothenberg, who's a close friend and colleague of Pierre Joris, um, was one of Ceylon's first translators into English. And there's this interesting text that Rothenberg writes, again, one of these anecdotes about Ceylon, or many anecdotes about manga and Ceylon. It's, you know, hard to deal with sometimes. But, um, and this is where Rothenberg recounts meeting Ceylon in Paris, and Ceylon spoke broken English, and Rothenberg spoke, spoke broken German. And then at the end, um, Roth, so Rothenberg claims, <laughs> Um, they realized that they had a common language, which was Mama Loshan Yiddish, um, but they never spoke it, <laughs> um, which is also an interesting kind of like apparitional moment. Um, but Pierre Joris, is, is, his mother tongue is, is I believe, Luxembourgish. Um, and he often remarks about the similarities between, I mean, I don't know how accurate, you know, but it's more about the anecdote that's interesting that the similarities between his mother tongue and Yiddish. And so he often actually kind of makes interesting remarks about Yiddish when he's talking about Ceylon, just kind of, it somehow informs his linguistic sensibility. Um, I think they're very good translations. Uh, I see uh, Aviva. What about his trip to Israel in 1969 and a short time after that he killed himself? commit suicide, exactly as his friend Luca from uh, Paris, that I asked about the surrealism that developed in the same time, more or less after uh, the first surrealist, like André Beton and the other. But yeah. what do you know about what de did his suicide feel after so short time after he wrote poems about Tel Aviv and he was in Israel in 69? So yeah, Ceylon visited Israel for the first, as you said, for the first, first, first and only first time. Um, um, sorry. Um, for the first and only time in 1969. Um, if I can actually just quickly share my screen again. Um, there's a very interesting, I just cut it for time. Um, but um, there's a, a journal called Die Stimme, which is a German language journal based in Israel that was like the Chernovitzer Landsmannschaft. <laughs> um, there's lots of interesting writing in that journal about Ceylon, you know, devotees of Ceylon. 
And this is an article in that journal from Tel Aviv in German, where they're greeting Ceylon's visit. Um, and in the, <laughs> in the text, they cite in Yiddish, in transcription, monger, which is just kind of an interesting um, here, uh, what is it like? Uh, you have a course in Paul Ceylon in Israel, mit großer Freude und Wünschen. It's like we, we greet him with like great joy and we, we wish that his like visit, folgen wir in der Hoffnung, dass auch für ihn eines Tages Mangus wird, Wirklichkeit wird. So it's like this idea that like his, the hope of his visit, that they'll like internalize um, or realize Manger's verse um, about wandering in the foreign um, and then finding a way home. So, you know, the politics of that are complicated and also very interesting. Um, but I think actually one of the, the surrealism part I think is important also here. I don't know much about it, but just like a kind of point that I think is really um, understudied and what I'm kind of hope, like working on a bit is that Yiddish played a major role in his visit to Israel. There's been a lot of focus on his relationship with Hebrew language writers, with Yehuda Amichai, his speech to the Hebrew Writers Association. You know, these are, of course, the central events um, of his visit, Gershom Sholem, etc. cetera. Um, but Fried Weininger was in the audience in Haifa um, when Ceylon was there. A lot of the Yiddish writers who were from Chernobyl who were interested in Ceylon attended his readings. Um, there's a very interesting requiem that Weininger writes in the 80s, where he recounts this visit in De Golden Kate. Um, I think this visit is extremely complicated. I'll, I'll leave it at that. I see other questions, but yeah, I just wanted to share that little um, bit. Uh, Aviva? Your comments. Um, first, yourself as a very young scholar, it is very impressive the mastery of the languages and the conceptual um, analysis of the text is very impressive, and I am very happy to see a young scholar emerging <laughs> into excellence. Um, I would like to ask you, um, how did you get involved in uh, study of, of these two? Um, um, poets for, for comparison literature, for comparative literature? Personally, how did you get involved? Yeah. Um, so this is a, this talk is a, a little bit of an experiment to be honest. I am writing part of my dissertation about the Yiddish language reception of Ceylon, which includes a lot of other translators, Shlema Bickel, who is also a, was a friend of Manger, by the way, um, very interesting figure. Um, and, uh, but I, so Ceylon was my first interest from, from several years ago. Um, I mean, there's nothing I think remarkable about it. I was in a class and, you know, in college many years ago and we read some Ceylon poetry and I, I guess I got hooked. Um, and I think like many people, I read the John Felsner biography and found that extremely illuminating. I think now I have a more critical view of that biography, but you know, regardless, it was an informative reading experience. Um, but I think actually through Ceylon, I think through his, the way he uses language and thinks about language was one opening I had towards Yiddish. Um, and so I started becoming interested in Yiddish literature later on. Um, and for me, I think what really, what I was kind of trying to do here, at least as a first attempt to think through some issues was, what were these kind of connections between Manger and Ceylon? Because Manger kind of hovers, he is himself like an apparition in a lot of the Ceylon reception. And there's like these and it's interesting anecdotes, which are often contradictory about Ceylon, you know, dismissing him or Ceylon loving him <laughs> or, you know, um, and I, you know, I don't think we'll ever, you know, that's not what interests me, whether I don't, we're never going to be in the mind of Ceylon or Manger, but um, kind of thinking through the implications and yeah, I'll leave it up. I, I think that the, the fact that he survived and he has taken his life, like Primo Levi's that survived and taken his life, so some 
um, big losses to humanity um, to survive and then to take your life. Yeah. Um, I, there, I didn't talk about it um, today, but there's a very, actually it was recently translated into English in the um, Chava Rosenfarb wrote an essay about Ceylon um, called, uh, it was published in Die Goldene Kate in the early 90s in Tel Aviv, and it was called Paul Ceylon und seine Goyo Brida, um, and Paul Ceylon and his brothers in fate. Um, and it's about suicide among survivors, among Jewish survivors. It's a very difficult mm -hmm. essay. Um, like, mm -hmm. <laughs> like emotionally difficult. Um, and one of her theses, if you will, um, is that, that there was an epidemic of suicide among survivors and that Yiddish and Hebrew provided a certain degree of protection or immunity um, and German did not. I mean, whether we accept that claim or not is you know, beside the point, but it's an interesting claim. But then she also is, really sitting with Ceylon for a long time. And Ceylon appears in some of her short stories, um, which also thematize suicide. So I think actually that topic you're pointing to is something that really preoccupied a lot of Yiddish writers interested in Ceylon. There are unpublished biographies of residents of Chernovitz. Uh, I was given one and um, I used to have at Hebrew University a classmate and her father was from Chernovitz and he was a professor at the Technion till age 90. And he has written a biography and never published that. And I have upstairs um, given to me by a resident of Chernovitz a biography of a physicist. Um, and so maybe if you, if, I would like to give it to somebody to publish. It is it is in my possession at the moment, but um, so maybe I should uh, transfer it to the Hebrew University. I, uh, what would be the right um, um, course? Um, because you never know what is in, in it that is of relevance to to scientific research, linguistically and uh, and otherwise. Yeah, I, I would recommend reaching out to librarians at the National Library. Yeah, mm -hmm. I did donate another book that was given to me that wasn't uh, there, and, uh, I, uh, and so I would. Great, I, I'm very happy that I attended today your talk. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you. Dale uh, Borka, I saw that. Okay, sorry, um, thank you very much, first of all, for this very, very interesting way of, you know, uh, talking to us about uh, all this topic. I'm going to be very short. Um, you are obviously all, as I can see from, <laughs> let's say, developed word. Uh, this means mostly uh, um, America, Germany, and so on, Austria. But uh, my question would be, uh, Celan's poetry, is it, or in which language is, is it, I mean, has been translated up to now. Uh, I'll be more concrete. Um, is it translated into Serbian? I'm from Belgrade, Ashkenazi from Belgrade, um, Serbia. Thank you very much. Um, I, I mean, I do speak German, I don't need it, but uh, I mean, but I just, it would be nice to yeah. spread it, you know, to, to Eastern Europe too. Um, I'm not sure, to be honest. Um, my guess is yes. I don't know how much. <laughs> um, I'm going to do it, uh, the research on the terrain, uh, because I'm not sure. <laughs> so It would be very interesting to know, yeah. I, yeah I mean, thank you. The number of translations are huge. Uh, you know, um, I'm sure there's at least a few poems. It would be interesting to see how much. Like, you know, I'm sure like Death Fugue is translated and the kind of you know great hits as it were, but it would be interesting to see that much. Thank you all once more for being here. Uh, thank you again, Matthew Johnson. Um,
a good night and we will see you on our next event. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Thank you very much.